Good morning, Interweb. Welcome back to the Artifexian podcast. Timekeeping on the galactic scale. Is universal galactic time even doable? Jigsaw puzzles, why they are my new favorite thing. In Icairn, the groundsfolk have seized a tower in Lansk. Is open warfare upon the inhabitants of Icairn? Will the companies clamp down hard or will the common folk prevail? And finally, an extended discussion about the merits of modern day secondary worlds. All that plus lots more in this month's episode. Okay, right. I'm beginning to crash. So That's here bad. we are. Um, Do you mean like biologically or your computer? Biologically. My computer's fine. Oh, do you want to hear a great thing about my computer? I do. So I bought a new computer. I bought a desktop um, in an effort to reduce render times and to make productivity better. And oh my God, it's insane. I had, I was rendering an 18 minute video the last mm-hmm. day. And so th- this isn't going to be a direct one-to-one comparison because I was using different programs and there's different, you know, amounts of graphics in each of the videos, etc. Um, But historically, an 18-minute video on my previous computer might have taken between maybe three and four hours to render. Um, Jesus. Yeah. And it, with this computer, it took nine minutes. <laughs> It was better than real time. And I was like, what? I thought there was some sort of error. I was like, this can't be right. Maybe it only rendered out the first like couple of frames. It's like, no, no, no. The entire thing is nine minutes. Now I've since done um, some testing to try and make a more like for like comparison. Um, and it works out that the rendering time is always just a little bit greater than real time. Um, when you control for various variables and things like that. Um, so before it was 3x real time to render. And now it's like 1.1, 1. 1. 1.2, um, which is just class. So my computer is not very crashing. Good. My computer is doing very good. My biological systems are crashing because I'm very tired. And you're very okay. tired too, Bill, as well, aren't you? I am very tired. Yes. We're, we're all very tired. So uh, Working Artif- hard. Yeah. So artifacts, yeah, just bear with us. This this might be a disaster. Um, the sleepy episode. A sleepy episode. All our all of our world building will be about sleep and dreams <laughs> and beds. Oh, stop, Bill! Pajamas. Bill, you can't be doing that. That's oh, that sounds so <laughs> good right now. Um, so it looks like we've started the show. Uh, so would you like to do some follow up? <laughs> Let's do some follow up. So you have a thing here in the show notes. Uh, Svarog the Lesser. Uh, address the comment to you in Reddit. What's going on? Um, so as far as the lesser you had a question for me or a, a thought uh, regarding the, the world building I've been doing, we learned in the last episode that uh, the companies have infiltrators and agents within the labor movement, within the, the striking movement. And their question is, how would the anti-company slash strike movement take it if they learned agents were being planted to take advantage of them? Would this undermine the movement with mistrust and doubt over the leader's motives or lead to a stronger resentment against the companies and redoubled efforts? Would an internal witch hunt ensue? Might it be something they seek to turn to their advantage, playing or turning the agents right back at the companies? Um, So, yes, all of those are are definitely possible outcomes. I guess the thing is that the, the important factor is that the the labor movement, the, the agitators, aren't a unified front. And even though the companies aren't necessarily, the, they're, they're, the companies are in competition with each other, but they are still representing common interests when it comes to being um, in opposition to the labor movement. So even though they're not, you know, exactly unified front, they will have common goals. So, you know in pursuit of preserving company power in general is a little bit more unified than um, disparate groups not coordinating in in being opposed to companies. So there wouldn't be a kind of a single thing to, to happen should it come out that the, they are being infiltrated. And I'd imagine a lot of the, the agitators know that there are infiltrators and, and agents trying to take advantage. 
So um, that might be something I will I will have to examine in a future story. Can I ask a question about real life, Bill? Yep. Um, why is it that there's a lack of like unification there? I'm thinking in particular about like the unionizing efforts that appear to be going on on the internets right now. It seems to be quite trendy. Like, there's lots of subreddits like anti-work and things like that, just mm-hmm. promoting a lot of uni- unionization. But from my perspective, it seems to be a very disparate thing. Like it's pockets of activity going on about the place. This is specifically in the States. Um, and like m- most workers would agree that like bad working conditions and crap pay is not good for them. So like it's mad that there isn't kind of like a unified front there, given that, ev- given that everyone... Uh, agrees on the fundamentals there um what's that about why isn't there just like the union um because i mean different different workplaces in different industries will have different concerns um and i think if you had like one massive union in general um to to kind of represent all unions that would no, it would stop being a union it would start being something else and it would no longer be able to focus on specific industries things. You know, and, and the, the the bigger industries, they would get all the attention and smaller mm. things would, would be forgotten about. Mm. Um, I would imagine that would be part of it. And also there's no, there's no real political backing for it in the United States. I mean, there's no... Uh, I, I, I don't think there's a mainstream party that really has labor rights as its core mm-hmm. interest. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, to, to coordinate that side of things on a national scale. Um, I mean, I, there isn't in Ireland either, <laughs> really. Um, there isn't in the UK either, really. But we we do, we have fairly strong unions in this country, No. Yeah, yeah, we do. But no. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I don't think there's a, there's kind of a, uh, I mean, it's, it's better than the States, I would say. It's better than hmm. the United States. But there isn't necessarily a kind of a national coordination of, of labor in the same sense. Hmm. Okay, cool. So that was Svarog the Lesser on Reddit. Now, um, I have a comment here from a, a person called Redere, R-E-D-E-R-E, coming on the YouTube um, I was complaining the last episode that my name was untranslatable into Irish. And mm-hmm. so I was seen as always the weird foreign kid who didn't have an Irish name in school when all the other kids were given an Irish name. Uh, according to them, acor- um, th- quote, according to the Oxford Dictionary of Family Names in Ireland, Irish does have a translation for Edgar, but it's used for surnames. It's Egyar. Possibly, I don't exactly know how to pronounce it. Uh, e fada i g e a r. Basically, everyone with the surname Agar is descended from people named Edgar in the Middle Ages. So you could have gone by Agar Kil uh, Kulglas Kul Kil Quil Quilglas. How do you Quilglas. Mean? Quilglas. Quilglas. Yeah. Which basically means Edgar Greenwood. Um, so yeah, I mean, like that's stretching the rules a little bit, but I feel like my my the principal could have done a little bit of homework to be like, let's let's give this let's make this kid feel included, let's just give him some sort of name. But no, no, I was always Edgar Grunwald. Um, <laughs> very frustrating, but it's cool. I, and that's kind of a baller name, Agar Quellglass. That's kind of cool. That is that is kind of great. What about translating the meaning? Uh, the meaning of Edgar's spear of light, apparently. Spear of light. Light, as in light from the sun. Light. Yeah. So... Not like the Coke. Not like L-I-T-E. The cool light, you know? <laughs> what? <laughs> I, I Coke light? Is that not a thing? Coke light? L-I-T-E? No? Am I making that I up? I don't know. Ah, okay. I don't, know. <laughs> I don't drink Coke. <laughs> but yes, um, spear of light, uh, which I'd imagine is going to be an absolute mouthful. Spear is gay. Okay. G A E. Uh, and life would be Sullus. Sullus. So I don't know how to turn that into a name because the names would be like kind of quite old constructions. And also, that would be, there'd be genitival construction there because spear of. Oh, yeah. Light. Well, be, yeah, like Gay Silsha. Sure. But it doesn't, that doesn't sound like a name. No. 
Okay. Eén keer. We'll work, we'll work enough. We'll figure it out. <laughs> we'll work. I'll, I'll work the homework for next, for next episode. <laughs> but so, thank you, Roderi, for doing just more work than my principal did which is which is which is good um next up we have um a comment on chinese naming from mm-hmm. gugu 0202 our resident hong konger uh this is a giant wall of text so i'm just going to link this in the show notes for anyone who's interested to get the perspective of uh, asian naming conventions from a person living in asia check it out it's really fun um the th- uh, just to paraphrase and pick out some of the things that I found uh, really interesting, j- just the sheer volume of potential uh, names that a person could have, I found really interesting. They were saying, Google was saying that um, you have like your set of formal names, like your first name and second name, but you also have, you can have like aliases, um, childhood names called milk names. Um, you can have a school name. So you're given a new name in school, I take it, by a teacher. Um, if you're in the Buddhist tradition, you get like a, a Dharma name or a Dharma title. Um, monarchs apparently have temple names. And there's just a whole bunch of names um, going around the place, which I think is really fun. And you in comments, Bill, on the Reddit brought up um, the kind of vibe of uh, British monarchy, where any one of them, have like a bajillion different titles and names depending on what context they're in. And they change over time as well. Yeah, and I think that's just, that's a really fun idea. Like, it's really fun to play with that as opposed to just being like, I am Edgar Grumwald and I'm just always Edgar Grumwald. Nothing's happening Mm. to that. It's just staying that way. I'd love to be in a culture where you'd chop and change name depending on context. That'd be cool. And I'd imagine that it does happen a lot and that's, that's just the kind of thing... You know, you you need to get out of your cultural cultural frame sometimes when world building, and you know, think about stuff like that because you know why would our approach to names be the only one? And and that's that's why I love examples like this that that there is. But then when when we when we look at it, we can find that we we are familiar with it. We just don't necessarily think of it in the same way, mm-hmm. like here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, I forgot one. A post uh, posthumous posthumous. How do you pronounce that word? Posthumous. Posthumous. That's a that's a preposterous sounding name, posthumous. Uh, you can also get posthumous names. So when you die, th- these are rare apparently, but after you die, um, you've been given a name. That seems fairly. I, I can see that happening in our culture as well, and, and, and it remind me as well of of um, Gandhi, because uh, I think Gandhi also went by a ton of names, because um, because his name. Oh, I could be wrong here. His name wasn't Mahatma Gandhi. I think Mahatma was some sort of given thing, some sort of title. Um, yeah, I think so. And then he also went by Bapu. Uh, I think his per- uh, people who knew him personally uh, referred to him as Bapu. Um, and there's a couple of other names that, that, that he went by as well. So yeah. not an uncommon thing. And, and particularly if, if it's happening in like like South and Southeast Asia, statistically, it's more common than what we do because just so many people are using this system. Um, so we're kind of like the odd ones here. So I thought that was really fun. Please, everyone, go check out the entirety of the comment because it's really informative. It's just very, very, very long and I can't read it out uh, all on air. So, uh, Goo Goo 0202, thank you. Um, now, finally, uh, we got a really interesting email, I think, anyways, from uh, Liana Kalam. Um, and I've summarized this, or I've, I've entitled this email, Timekeeping on a Galactic Scale. So I'll just I'll read out the email and I'll get your opinions on this, Bill. Um, how do you tackle time when you have a galaxy of worlds? In individual worlds, I've always already established their time according to orbits and stuff. But I want to create a sort of standard or universal time, so to speak. I've a, I've a lot of characters who are star sailors and travel to different worlds. I thought about having their ships reflect the time of their worlds, which makes sense. But I was thinking of having some kind of universal time system, something that would be used by naval starship captains or something. What if there are important events that happen only in space, like battles or starship cruiser disasters? I would like to have some sort of documented time that is recorded in history. Maybe I can use the time of a nearby world, but space is pretty big with lots of, well, space. I'm no math or <laughs> science expert, um, but I like to work a little logic into my creativity. How would you go about creating a universal time? I've never thought about this before, Bill. 
uh, and that's why it struck me as a very interesting email. What do you think? I can think of a couple of approaches here. Mm-hmm. Go for it. Uh, let me gather my thoughts. Um, okay, so if you want to make something universal, you can either build up from small units. So you 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 kind of take a, a small, like, a minimum possible unit of time and scale up from that. Like, for, I mean, if, and if we're going to be totally universal, let's say, like, plank time or something, and you use that as, as a fundamental system and build up from there. Um, and you would have to start counting from an arbitrary point. Like, you know, like to do with, like, Unix time or whatever. Yeah, sure. And that way it is equally applied to everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, Another possibility would be, if we're talking on, like, a galactic scale, to to go down from above, take a large period of time and subdivide it. Uh, So if we say we're talking a galactic scale, the rotation of the galaxy. And then you treat that as, like... Equilio, analogous to a year and divide down from there mm-hmm. until we get to human usable units. Um, and again, that will apply equally arbitrarily to everyone. Um, the issue, I guess, is can we think of time as being consistent? When we're talking about something on that scale, uh, you know, the, the galaxy being however many thousands of light years across, um, and time, you know, being relative and not necessarily consistent um, within everyone's perceptions. How do you account for that? How do you account for relativistic perceptions of time? And, you know, can you really say that there is a, a single kind of standard time um, when you're dealing with things on that scale? Yeah. What happens if a Starship cruiser uh, became derelict or whatever beside a black hole? Yeah, or just they're traveling at different speeds yeah. over over long distances. They're going to drift out of synchronicity. Mm. Um, so, I mean, that that is a, uh, you know, if you're thinking very hard about it, a, a hard science kind of thing, you know, time isn't going to necessarily be consistent over long, long distances. Yeah, what about um, time being set by uh, political entities? Yeah. Um, Kind of like how, you know, the British Empire conquered like 75% of the world and brought the imperial system with it. And like, to hell with what the people were doing there. They're now using this system. Um, Could you argue, would you be comfortable with something like that? Like the Borg, the Borg have their way of measuring time. And when they did take over all the various worlds and stuff, they just set that as a de facto standard time measuring system and force it to become universal. Everyone uses this because we're dominant. Sure, that that makes sense. That seems to be a little bit contrary to the to the the spirit of the question, though. So, like, what, what how will that have anything to do with um, things happening in in deep space? And you know, it said maybe I could use the time of a nearby world, but you know, that that's not necessarily going to be going to be um, useful in that context. But mm. I mean, it, it makes it makes sense in a narrative point of view. Mm. Okay. Um. Actually, there's maybe a third approach. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is kind of what they do in Embassy Town, um, that you you base it on human relevant um, units. So I don't know if you remember this in Embassy Town, but people record their ages in kilo hours. Uh, I have not read Embassy Town, and just for for the folks, that's uh, another China medieval novel. We reviewed one of their novels back in the past, but not this one. I'll throw a link in the show notes. Definitely right. We, we reviewed Embassy Town on the podcast. Oh, wait. Am I thinking... Sorry, no, I'm thinking of... The, oh, sorry, I'm thinking of Perdido Street Station is the one I didn't read. Sorry. Yes, Embassy right. Town was the one with the... I was with, losing my mind for a second. Sorry, yeah, no, I'm, I'm completely wrong. We're tired. I'm sorry. Um, the That's the one with the aliens that come in two things, two, two varieties, wherever they speak at the same time with the fractional notation. Uh... The, the aliens have, have, have two mouths. Yeah, have two yeah. mouths, yeah. And they speak same time with fractional notation. Embassy town. Yeah. Yes, you're right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. They measure time in kilo what, majigs? Kilo hours. Kilo they measure hours. Their, their, their ages in kilo hours because they're humans and everywhere um, that they are inhabiting has a different, like, uh, daily cycle or whatever. 
So that's kind of, you know, that that is their standard. Now, again, that doesn't necessarily answer the question here of how can you use it to record uh, events in history? There's no reference to, to something else to record events in history. Um, but it's, you know, it's kind of a, a, a provoking starting point for thinking about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is tangentially related or barely related, but just to bring up uh, KSR's thing about the Mars trilogy once again. Mm-hmm. I think that's that's a kind of fun sort of like imposing a time system where it doesn't really fit. Um, so in the in the Mars trilogy, or at least in book one, because I've not read the rest of the books, and we reviewed it before in the past. Um, there, it's it's set on Mars. Humans go to Mars, start terraforming it, making it into a more Earth-like planet, and the time system they use instead of just like taking Mars's day and dividing it up into even segments. They just take the Earth's day and just imp- superimpose that on Mars, and the two don't fit together. There's a time slip period at the end of each day where um, just the clocks stop in order to sync it back up with, with Earth time, and then the clocks start again. And I think it was something like 39 minutes. Um, so that's you know, ta- very tangentially related, but it just popped into my head, and I think that's a fun thing to do with time. Yeah, that is a strategy people could use. Um, yeah, yeah, it is. It is. It is a very, very tricky problem for all for all of those reasons. And I think that if you're being hard science about it, the most important one is time isn't actually as fixed as we might think of it, especially when we're dealing with things on those kind of galactic scales. Um, yeah, I wonder if anyone in comments can name a work of fiction, like a work of hard fiction that like, um, or hard science that goes into this, because I can't really think of anything that operates on that large scale that has explored this. Um, nor I. Nor I. Yeah, yeah. But it was a very top fucking email. I really enjoyed that. So uh, thank you, Liana. Thank Kayla. you, Liana. Um, right. Uh, that's kind of follow up done. I, can I just throw in? A really quick little thing. Uh, of course, Edgar. Just, and it's not relevant to anything. I, as of two days ago, I have found a new curiosity in life. Oh. Um, and I'm wondering if any, if there are any like-minded people out there. So that's why I'm trolling on the show. Puzzles, Bill. I've started watching mm-hmm. a lot of videos about puzzles. Like, as in jigsaw puzzles. Um, specifically jigsaw puzzles, specif- not like... Yeah, specifically jigsaw Sudoku's. puzzles. No, no, not those. I, I do like a good Sudoku every now and then. Um, uh, gotta love me some X-Wings. Um, but yeah, no, jigsaw puzzles. And they, it's really fascinating. I've watched, I cannot tell you how much content I've watched of people making gradient jigsaw puzzles. So like the entire jigsaw puzzle is just a gradient, like like the Photoshop histogram. That's it. And they just put it all together and it's beautiful. It's really interesting. I've watched... That sounds really hard. Yeah, I know. And then I've watched a ton of uh, videos on people making monocolor jigsaw puzzles. So just the jigsaw puzzle, it's just all white or all red. Um, And it's really fascinating. And it's it's made me want to go out and buy puzzles again because I have not done a jigsaw puzzle since I was a small child. But apparently there's like a thriving community of puzzlers out there. Um... And I really want to go buy a jigsaw puzzle. So if there's any like-minded jigsaw puzzle enthusiasts out there, talk to me in comments. I want to. I want to hear from you. Give me some recommendations of, of uh, what to buy and what to get. Um, and then I saw this one awesome 3D gradient sphere jigsaw puzzle. So it's a jigsaw puzzle, and by oh. end of it, it's a 3D sphere. That's a gradient map, and it's amazing and it's beautiful, like like a work of art. So I think I might I might go buy some jigsaw puzzles. Um, that's it. That's my little comment. <laughs> um, for the the monochrome ones, are all of the pieces unique, or could some pieces go in like multiple places? So all of the on. So what I've learned is that there are good jigsaw puzzles and there are bad jigsaw puzzles. Um, okay. The good jigsaw puzzles are entirely unique. Um, so there's wow. one solution. So you so everything works right uh, and that makes it easier apparently because you can't well i don't know uh, they people seem to th- to look for that like it's a it's a disadvantage if there's not a unique solution apparently um and there's this one girl um 
I think her name is Karen Puzzles. I think I'll leave a link in the show notes. Um, this this is a channel I've stumbled upon and I really enjoy. Uh, she reviewed a monocolor jigsaw puzzle made by Heinz, as in the ketchup company. And it was okay. it was just it was a promotional PR thing, and it was just a you know, a red square. Um, and she has a video on trying to solve it, and she had to give up after like many many hours of attempts because none of the pieces um, were unique. So she was like, "It is unsolvable. I cannot solve this um, because everything can go everywhere, and I have nothing to go on." And she just gave up entirely. It was like, "This is a load of nonsense." It sounds like going to be easier. Yeah, it's worth checking out the video so you can hear exactly what she says about it. Um, okay. But it's weird because she classes um, like gradient puzzles as being easy. Like it's easy mode for her. She's just like, it's grand, totally fine. Um, but this mono monochrome Heinz puzzle that had no unique solution was caused her to quit. Um, so yeah, I don't know. And then there's like, there, there's apparently there's a whole bunch of like, th- there's like a whole culture here. There's like, uh, you can get like trick jigsaw puzzles that like, um, have like false corners and false edges in it. Um, and they look, they look like edges, but they actually go in the middle of the puzzle. So you kind of have to do an actual, like, it's like a logical sort of thing, not just like find a piece and put it down. Like there's a whole variety of things here or like jigsaw puzzles that have like different solutions so like there's like let's say there's a puzzle that has like um uh let me see what's six by six 36 pieces right um you can make out of that not just a six by six square uh, of the jigsaw puzzle you could have like a say a three by three puzzle that would work entirely and then uh, also and also the six by six so there's many different types of puzzle contained within one set of jigsaw puzzles and just this world man it's fascinating that's cool it's really cool isn't it um and then there's like clear jigsaw puzzles and i was like that seems daft but then you suddenly realize that uh, you can mirror a piece you know because it's clear um because in a standard jigsaw puzzle you only look at a piece in one direction because Mm. because of the picture but the minute you make them clear suddenly the the reverse of the the jig of the jigsaw puzzle piece becomes viable as a p- potential solution, and it's just this whole world, Bill. It's so fascinating. So I'm gonna I'm gonna buy myself a jigsaw puzzle. I'm gonna put on a podcast, and I'm gonna solve a jigsaw puzzle because I think this is really interesting. Links in the show notes to all of this. That, that clear jigsaw puzzle. It's kind of it's almost it's almost like it's more pure. It's it's pure puzzle. Like the 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 visual aspect isn't. It's 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 just about how the pieces fit together. Mm, mm-hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, and see again. Prior to two days ago, if you'd asked me about like jigsaw puzzles, I'd be like, they're really boring. It's like a picture. <laughs> <laughs> There's a picture on a bunch of a bunch of tiles. Great, put it all together again, and then what? Just destroy it. Um, but no, this world seems so rich. Um, but anyway, anyway, I need to get off this tangent. Just if anyone's into puzzles, please talk to me. I've become into puzzles. I like it. Um, that's follow up done. Shall we move into main topic? Let's move into main topic. World building engaged. So this episode, we're going to be reading uh, a declaration. Uh, a notice attached to a barricade in the city of Lansk. Mm, very good. Hereby, according to our rights, ancient and perfect, and as legitimate prices of conquest, we declare control of the Lansk Old Tower and surrounding environs. The following is a list of statements and demands of the Lansk Popular Executive. The Old Tower is a rightfully seized property and will not be returned to control of municipal and our company authorities. All area within the barricades is considered under the protection of the Lansk Popular Executive and will not be ceded. The vessels docked here and at the waterfront are similarly seized as prizes. The batteries of these vessels are crewed by experienced personnel and are well supplied. The deaths of those slain in the seizure of these properties, while regrettable, as are all deaths, were casualties of war. Their remains shall be afforded full dignity 
and provisions will be made to return them to the communities where necessary. All prisoners taken are prisoners of war, and will be afforded full protection and dignity. Where possible, all industry within the barricades shall continue. Groundsfolk and workers may enter and leave as necessary for the continuation of their labour. The proceeds of this labour shall be put towards the protection and maintenance of the old tower and environs, and the benefit of the population herein. No company personnel shall approach within 15 lengths of the barricades. Attempts to do so will be considered hostile. No company vessels shall dock at the tower. Attempts to approach shall be considered hostile. For the purpose of negotiation and parley, bailiffs and municipal personnel shall be permitted to approach the barricades under flags and forms of truce, in groups of no more than five. Any attempt to approach otherwise, or any breach of the forms of truce, will be considered hostile. We call for the immediate resignation of Chief Bailiff Baron Te Eintov on the grounds of corruption, abuse of power, and unsuitability for office. We reject the imposed authority of the companies. We call for the cessation of municipal contracts with the Tamar, Valdin, and Eltian companies. Our struggle is the struggle of all groundsfolk in Abesk and all workers in all nations. Though desiring peace, we recognize our existence in a state of war and as such will not seek violence but will engage in violence where necessary to protect our liberties. Printed pamphlet affixed to a barricade in Lansk. Handwritten slogans in the margins read, Solidarity with the Nomad Ears, The Spires are ours, Agitate, etc. Bill, I have yep. so much highlighted here. It's not even funny. Brilliant. <laughs> I think this is the most highlighted piece I have ever had of yours. Um, so hopefully, That's good. Hopefully there'll be a lot to discuss here. Well, it's either that or I'm thoroughly confused. So you just need to wait and find out. <laughs> um, first off, I feel like this podcast is becoming like communist agitprop and I'm fairly okay with it, which is kind of cool. <laughs> This is a fictional setting. It's, exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, so, uh, yeah, give us give us a quick summary, and then I'll head into my my bullets. Um, so, in as part of the the ongoing uh, unrest and agitation in Abeski society, um, a a group of groundsfolk have seized control of one of the the towers in Lansk. So the 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 large uh, towers around which the the Abeski culture gets its kind of uh, nickname of the spires, they have taken over one of the spires in the city, um, and they've barricaded the area around it, and they've taken control of like this neighborhood, and this is a a declaration printed by the the people who took control, um, and posted at the barricades and distributed probably around the the wider city. Cool. Um, that answers some of my questions. So just okay. while you bring it up, let's focus on this. So the Lansk Old Tower. So mm-hmm. you said there that this is one of the spires that gives the name of the spires to, to these regions. Um, do I take it that this is kind of a sort of like vertical dock where airships dock at? Um, not not exclusively. You, you, you would get airships docking at it towards the top. But it's just like a, a large, like, you know, it's a, a, a big tower and there are businesses in it and there are people live in it and, you know, the offices and things. Oh, okay. Okay. And, and like old tower, uh, did this implies like some sort of like historic um, component to it. Is there a new tower? Yes. Are there multiple towers? Why did they go for old tower? Um, I'm sure there was some kind of... Uh, strategic or, or tactical reason that that old tower was appropriate um old tower is near the river so they're able to secure some some kind of docks some kind of keys um for resupply and stuff that doesn't require going through the the city like some of the other towers might but yeah there are uh 
seven complexes of towers, uh, one of which is five towers. The rest of them are all are all singular. Um, hmm. And Old Tower is the, the the second oldest in the city. Oh, so, sorry, so there are seven complex of towers in Lansk alone. In Lansk, in Lansk, right, yes. right, right. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. We there, there, there's a map of Lansk somewhere on on the Tumblr that we we uh, looked at before. Uh, that's the map that shows up every podcast episode. No, no, of Lansk, the city. <gasps> oh, I need to go dig that out. I'll see if I can go yeah. and dig that out. Uh, links in the show notes, folks. Um, okay, so, the, and the people who have taken Lance Old Tower here are the Lance Popular Executive, correct? Yes. Right, so explain to me what this is. Is this just literally a, a, a collection of grounds folk and they've given themselves this name or is there something more to it? No, it's, it's just that. It's just like it's this kind of revolutionary um, agitator group. Okay, and they were saying that uh, they they have taken this and they invoke their rights, ancient and perfect, as uh, mm-hmm. I guess a, a, a justification or something for taking it. Um, we've talked about rights, ancient and perfect before. Can you talk to me about that again? Um, is this a kind it, of it, common law sort of thing? Yes, it's kind of a stock phrase in um, in a besky. Uh, legality um to to say you know th- this is our right and we, we claim this right i take it the phrasing of this again apologies if i'm rehashing stuff i've asked before um but the phrasing that's of this true. feels very much like it's not something that's written down it's just assumed in the culture that like these sort of rights exist yes there, there isn't like a a constitution for a, a besky culture in general no there, there is an understanding of what laws are and certain things will be written down at certain times. But a basic culture isn't like a centralized nation. Sure, sure. Um, now, uh, how much does this hurt the Abeski taking the old tower? Like, as you said, there's a bunch of towers. Does this bother well, them? So, so th- the people who did this are Abeski. Uh, so, sorry, sorry, the companies, the companies. Um the how much does this does this help in the grounds folks struggle like is this ultimately a meaningless gesture or is this really going to hurt uh the people they're looking to hurt it's it's a powerful uh symbolic gesture certainly mm-hmm. um and they've taken over you know a decent chunk of the city um and restricted access to particularly the the valdean company um who who are have a depot nearby um, it has has impacted their uh, businesses. I'd imagine there would be um, company offices, building company offices in in the towers. Uh, so it's it's been it's 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 disrupted them significantly. Why why would they seize it and and attempt to hold it as opposed to seize it and destroy it? Because people live there. Yeah, but you you can you can ev- you can evacuate people. I'm thinking of like where would they go? I'm thinking of like Fight Club where they blew up all the buildings and it was kind of fine because no one was in the buildings, like the structure yeah, property. That would be just like taking over an asset and then getting rid of the asset. Here they 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 have this this symbol, um, and there are people living and working and stuff there, and they, they're not trying to harm those people. So, so I'm assuming that the the Lands popular executive then feels that they can, in fact, continue to hold this asset. Um, they, they intend to try. Okay. Um, and certainly for a while, it may not be a permanent thing, but it's you know, if it's not permanent, it's a powerful bargaining chip. Sure, that's like that's actually a really good point. Um, they mentioned that the batteries of these vessels are crewed by experienced personnel and are well supplied. These are the vessels that are now seized as prizes for for the land's popular executive. Um, yeah, who is manning these crews, and will these crews be okay with this land's popular executive, or is there a potential for um, mutiny there? Uh, it's it's held by mutineers. To help are like okay. but by, by by former but by, by former military people okay are, are crewing the crewing the, the batteries okay cool so, the, so that's a fairly safe acquisition on their part all these these vessels yeah yeah okay cool or at least that's what they're saying 
You know, it's, it's they're certainly whether or not it's true, they're certainly giving the the indication that they they have the the ability to to employ that force. Cool. IRL talk for a second. Um, can you, as much as I do love war stuff, particularly First World War stuff, I'm really bad with like legal definitions of things that go on in war. And I'm wondering if you could uh, sort it out here. And the thing that's making me think about it is your line, the the deaths of those slain in the seizures of these properties, while regrettable, uh, as are all deaths, were casualties of war. Mm -hmm. What defines a war and what defines a casualty of war? Like, when is a war a war? And when is the death of someone justifiable because it's in a war? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that oh. in real life. Okay, I would have thought with all your, like, naval history uh, interests that you might have something on that. Do you know anything about, like, the Napoleonic times or anything? Um, From a legal point of view, no. Um, I, I know that there were nominal, at least, uh, protections for civilians um, and, you know, for prisoners of war and stuff at the time, there was, like, rules of honour about, about how you would treat treat prisoners and particularly officers. Um, but I'm not I'm not clear on what all of the, the, the legal structure of it is. Mm. Okay. Um, and, and do you know anything about where this tradition of, like, treating prisoners with a modicum of respect... And dignity comes from again IRL. Um, I mean, it's it's probably practical to do so, so that your own prisoners get get treated well. You know, it's it's a it's a mutually beneficial thing to do that. Yeah, but I mean, I, I could be wrong here, so please, please, internet, correct me. But I, I was listening to a podcast on the uh, World War Two, uh, but specifically mm-hmm. only in the East, like what was going on in the Pacific Theater. Um, and apparently the Japanese during that time period, they they just didn't think this way. Apparently they they you know they had no quarter for for prisoners of war. Um and then th- that it reminded your writing reminded me of that. And I remember listening to that and going like, that's really interesting that during that time period they taught so differently. Because I like you, I would assume that it's like if we treat the prisoners good, our our prisoners will be treated good. But then you have cultures who just don't don't think like that at all. And I find that really interesting. And I don't really know what the reasoning is there. I mean, what 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 are you talking about with regards to, to Japan? Uh, I don't know that much about it. So, uh, nor do I. So that, just so again, internet, if I'm wrong, please point it out. But I, I think the reports... Oh, and also propaganda plays a huge element here. So I might be getting hmm. propagandized information. But but I think it was a report that like if if um, prisoners... Uh, if the Japanese took prisoners, they, you know, they would starve them. They would beat them. Uh, they would like, you know, torture them. They would bring them to the brink of death without kind of killing them because, you know, the potential for hostage exchange and things like that. Um, right, right, right. And I, I, I think they, I think the like some high ups viewed like a Westerners' practice of like keeping prisoners of war war healthy and happy as being like soft. Um, mm. That they weren't like you know they weren't militaristic. They weren't like hard men. That they were like m- mommying the the prisoners of war. So they just had a, I think they just had a completely different outlook on what it means to be yeah. a prisoner of war, which I find really fascinating and like i said i don't understand it Mm. i'm fairly sure that in napoleonic times prisoners of war would be used for like forced labor and stuff as well so i mean Mm. that's as recent as that i think it was happening in europe sure yeah Um, but you know they still not not like outright killing them sure and i just want to make it clear here like i don't want to come across to be like the way we act in the west is somehow better than the way others act at all. Like, I don't think there is a better when it comes to war. It's all horrible. It's just different flavors of horribleness. Um, and you know, you know what's really interesting, right? Just a bit of a, a personal story here. My grandfather uh, was a prisoner of war in Egypt. And he oh. he died when I was, I think he was five. Uh, and I just, I, and he died quite young because of shrapnel. He had like a bunch of shrapnel. I, I've been told it was like shrapnel in his heart, which I don't entirely believe. Um, <laughs> but apparently he died as a result of uh, injuries incurred in the war. Um, and I just, I wish he was able to live a little bit longer. I'd love to talk to him 
uh, about that, particularly because like he fought for the bad guys. And I would really like to, I would have loved to talk to him about that and get his opinions on, find out whether or not like he believed what he was fighting for or was he duped into it? Um, what was it like? I mean, because it's a rare thing, I think, that people could have an opportunity to talk to someone who is a prisoner of like a world war. Like that doesn't happen an mm. awful lot, certainly to people in Ireland, um, but like never had that chance. He he died he died quite young and I'm like, oh, that would have been interesting to, f- to find that out. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, anyhow, anyhow, onwards. The proceeds uh, of this labour shall be put towards protection and maintenance of the old tower and environs and the benefit of the population therein. That's just straight up communist agitprop there. So, well played. I mean, that's, yeah. <laughs> How much business they'll be able to do is is yet to be seen um, while they're they're maintaining the barricades. But yeah, they're, this is their whole thing that the... the, the they're not getting the proceeds of, of, of what they're doing. And this is what they're setting out to, mm-hmm. to rectify. Mm-hmm. Um, skipping down a bit further, uh, you write, um, for the purpose of negotiation and parley, bailiffs and municipal personnel should be permitted to approach the barricades under flags and forms of truce. Gotta love me some flags, Bill. So what's going <laughs> on here? What, I'm assuming white is probably not the color of of truce or peace or something here have you made any sort of have you been thinking at all about this like how does one indicate i am a non-combatant i come in peace well originally i was thinking you know what i don't want to do flags flags seems you know it's 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 a bit too normal and um, a bit too real world uh but it's real world for a practical reason that you can see it from a distance <laughs> it's very clear what um, about what about what about musical instruments could you have like a horn of peace that's very interesting. Mm. Perhaps you could. Yeah. Perhaps you could. Because, I mean, it, it, yeah, it wouldn't be that hard to just come up with, like, a two-note little melody that is universally understood to be, you know, peace. Um, yeah. And you could hear it from far off, you know? I guess you couldn't mm-hmm. tell exactly... It'd be hard to tell at a glance in a crowd, for example, who is the peaceful one. Because, yeah. you know, the flag helps in that sort of way. Um, but in any case, the other form uh, and forms of truce, what do you mean by that? Like f- under flags and forms of truce, what is a form of truce? So forms as in uh, behaviors. So there's you know, certain ways that you're expected to, to act and behave and like, you know, uh, a, a peace band on your sword kind of thing. Um, mm. uh, so it's kind of a formalized way of, of acting when you're when you're in parlay or when you're you're seeking a truce. Um, and if you if you break that, then it's it's seen as as hostile. Hmm. hmm okay. Um, skipping now further, this is the se- third to last point, um, the anti penultimate point. Um, <laughs> can you remind me who Chief Bailiff Bauren Te Eintov is? What what nastiness did he do in the past? So he is the he's the the Chief Bailiff of the city of Lansk, uh, and he ordered the what kind of turned into a massacre. Um, at a, a labor protest that we, we detailed a couple of years ago, um, in in Lansk there was a, a a kind of a meeting in a in a field near the Keys, and he ordered the bailiffs to charge and they wouldn't, so he uh, hired the Tamar Company to to break it up and mm-hmm. they mm-hmm. Uh, narrowly missed shooting a, a, at an Arthani vessel and people were killed in the in the crush. Yeah, and he's 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 deeply in bed with the with the Tamar company. Mm, mm. That would be the corruption that the grounds folks folks cite. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, a lovely man, all in all. Um, man, woman. I'm assuming man. Man, man. Yeah, yeah. Man. Um, in in general, Abeski names uh, four names that end with a consonant are usually male, and ending with a vowel are usually female. Oh, intr- I didn't know that. Interesting. Okay, cool. Now, a penultimate point. Um, quote, Though desiring peace, we recognize our existence in a state of war and as such will not seek violence, but will engage in violence when necessary to protect our liberties. Um, at the risk of this getting politicsy, um, IRL, talk for a second. What, what's your views on this? On, you know, the idea of that if there's a struggle for rights or whatever, what is the view about uh, taking the road of violence or non-violence? Because, you know, 
you know, uh, people like Gandhi, for example, I mentioned before, like staunchly um, anti-violent, like no violence, under no circumstances will we engage in violence uh, during the struggle. And then you have people like uh, Malcolm X, like the ballot or the bullet um, sort of thing, mm-hmm. where it's a more of kind of pragmatic approach, I guess, like we'll try and be peaceful, but like if it's not working, we need to get these rights. Where do you, what are your thoughts on this? I don't think violence, I don't think nonviolence is a viable tactic in a violent situation. And I think our concept of what uh, constitutes violence can be very limited in, in kind of the, you know, li- living in, in modern liberal democracies. Um, things that are outcomes of the system aren't perceived of as violence. Uh, but people... People dying from homelessness uh, while other people get rich on hoarding empty houses is violence. Sure. And you know what's really interesting? We're, we're definitely going to get into politics here, but I mean, this is kind of a politics-y sort of, you know, bit of writing, you know? There's not much we can do about it. Um, th- there's kind of that idea of, like, what violence means. I, I get the impression from just of the politics internet sphere that, like, there are two camps here. There are the camp that's like, yeah, you know, there's a broader meaning here. And then there's the other camp that go, you're redefining the word violence uh, in a sort of postmodern sort of way to basically mean anything you don't like. Um, and I think those people would say that what you just said would be would fall into that camp. And it's mad because, like, they say that this is a new invention. Like, it's a postmodern... Um, sort of word trickery going on but again going back to Gandhi I think one of his famous quotes and this is ages ago like this I don't know how many I'm near nearly a century maybe 70 80 years 70 ago. 80 years ago I think one of his famous quotes was uh, poverty is the worst form of violence so like yeah the word was being used like that like you know nearly a century ago and it's it's just it's mad it's, I, I I feel like people just they forget very quickly about history, like and how history works and, you know, what was said and done in the past, that there's kind of a precedent for this. Because I, I'm with you, like, I think I think the word the violence doesn't literally just mean you're beating someone up. Um, that's a very narrow, limited scope of what the word violence can mean. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I agree with your sentiment that, like, non-violence in a violent context doesn't work. Because, again, if we go back to Gandhi... Would that not be a counterexample to to that statement you just made? It it works as an alternative to violent resistance. So there's there's violent resistance, and then there is nonviolent resistance that you can engage with. But pure pure nonviolence as the only form of resistance doesn't work because there was there was there was people like uh, blown up soldiers and blown up police stations and stuff in India at the same time as Gandhi. Ah, okay. And so what you're saying is like the, the cumulative effect of all of that, Gandhi's nonviolence and other more violent campaigns resulted in the outcome that they wanted. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. That that would be that would be my feeling on it. Um that makes sense. and there's like there's I, I can't think of, of examples where a a nonviolent uh agitation for change in the face of violence. Uh, achieved anything unless there was also a a violent wing hmm. or a, 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 a not necessarily a wing but like a unless there was also a violent resistance that's yeah i can't think of anything off the top of my head either that's interesting yeah that's very interesting um yeah and then um i, I guess final point here going back to the piece is Two questions. Um, what is the next move for the grounds folk here? Or maybe more specifically, what's the next move for the Lance popular executive? Um, do they hunker in? Um, or are they going to try and take over more property? They're they're going to try and expand where the barricades are. So like, you know, kind of street by street, maybe move a barricade or build another one and and take over more just by getting the, the population on their side. That's their play. Okay, and the, so that seems to imply that the population is not currently on their side. Not, not fully. I mean, it's it's a major change, and it is standing up against many powerful external actors. 
you know the the bailiffs and the the companies um and it's you know it's 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 un, it's an unfamiliar situation it's not the status quo and change is always uh dangerous okay and what do you see is going to be the response of the companies so that, that's hard to figure out because you know, a, a direct violent engagement is very risky because it, it carries the, the the chance of, you know, large civilian populations, which have already caused them trouble in Lansk. Um, so do they want to do that further? Um, but they don't want to treat with them either and risk legitimizing them by, by doing so. Mm. So, yeah, they're, they're, everyone's in a tricky situation. Mm. And we're specifically talking about Lansk here, but um, I guess it's kind of going to ask you about stuff you might write in the future. But are, are is similar things going on in other cities or is Lansk uh, kind of unique here? It wouldn't be unique. It may, it's probably the, the most... Um, the most progress any of the movements have made. Yeah, yeah. It's probably the, the city with the most agitation. Mm. But there there are similar things happening and there are, there are uh, you know... Groups like the Lance Popular Executive, who, to be honest, like may not necessarily be a a well established group. Though I, I imagine that they that they were kind of around and they stepped in when this happened, rather than they planned it, or maybe they just arose um, after you know the the rioting and and the, the seizure happened um, mm-hmm. in order to, to to kind of give it legitimacy or to 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 give it a a, a front and a bit of a coordination. Um, but there are definitely people doing similar things or planning similar things and ready to do similar things in, in the other cities. Cool. Large scale warfare. I, I'm just, I don't know where you're going to go with this, but again, I'm really interested to see whether or not the companies will be toppled and that mm-hmm. form of control is is eradicated. And it'd be really interesting to see what the what it's replaced by. Um because again, I've spoken before about it, like it'd be a pretty crap combination of this thread. I think if it's like there was a popular uprising, the um, colonialist uh, companies are gone, and now everything is utopia and everyone gets along, and there's a robust welfare system and all that sort of crack. Um, <laughs> it'll be pretty lame. So I really just see like what comes in to replace it and how that might potentially be worse. Because we see an awful lot of that. Like you have, um, I don't know, like the, you have some sort of authoritarian and then like the uh, the people form a sort of militia group and uh, topple the authoritarian. And then all shock horror, the militia group are actually more authoritarian than the authoritarian that was there before. Um, <laughs> so it'd be really interesting to see what, what happens there. Because right now I'm like, the grounds folk are just like wonderful, beautiful, kind people. And like, that's almost certainly not the case. Like they are. I mean, like you know, they they did. A bunch of people did get killed in the sure the seizure here. Uh, some of them got thrown out of windows. Um, <laughs> what? When, from from the top of the old tower. Um, well, you say that as if that's like a, a thing. Is this is this a meme to get thrown out a window? Do you... I I wouldn't say it's a meme. Uh, they did it in Prague at least twice. Um, I've I've literally no idea what you're talking about. Is this like a notable event, like chucking people outside windows, or is it just there? There, there are. I think there's two events called the defenestration of Prague. <laughs> oh, no, hold on, there's three. The defenestration of Prague. Yeah, so the de- defenestration is to throw someone a window. I know, I know that. <laughs> yeah. Um. So on a, a couple of different times, or three times apparently, in in the history of Prague, uh, there were like riots and civil unrest, and you know city buildings were stormed and and the the offending parties were thrown out the window to their deaths wow yeah so the f- 1419 1483 and 1618 but usually when people say the defenestration of prague they mean the the 1618 event um which i think was <laughs> i think it was a, a religious conflict like, i really shouldn't laugh because like obviously getting thrown out of window at height is not a good thing but uh it's got a defenestration is such a, such a like hilarious word defenestration it's a good word it's a very good word yeah <laughs> i think we found our title anyhow the the, de- the defenestrations of lansk the, the, yeah exactly yeah the defenestrations of like lansk um did it, that's that's all my points um anything i missed 
And anything in closing? Um, no, I think I think we we pretty much covered everything. Um, as you as you picked up uh, with the hereby according to our rights, ancients and perfect, I've I've reused language from some other documents, from uh, a strike pamphlet from a few episodes ago, and from the uh, constitution of the, or the the charter or whatever I called it of the Tamar Company. Uh, that phrase appears there, um, and uh, something we will not seek violence is from the strike pamp or from the charter of the nomad, maybe. Mm. Um, so yeah, there's there's kind of stock phrases that 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 get used uh, both as sort of a besky legality and uh, kind of terms of the the ag- agitation mm. ideology, comrade. Um, so. <laughs> Yeah, that, yeah, exactly. Kind of shibboleths like that to to identify, um, you know, not just what I'm saying, but the way I'm saying it in, indicates mm-hmm. something about my background. So there's a few of those in there. Um, handwritten slogans, solidarity with the nomadiers, you know, that's the, the vessel that mutinied. The spires are ours. It's just, you know, we're going to take control um, and agitate. It's just a general call to action. But yeah, I think I think we've covered everything there. I'd imagine if this were if we were actually lads, I'd imagine some of the slogans would be like you know eighteens plus. To be fair, I think this is all very civil. Agitate, it'd be. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, this is a family podcast. This is a family podcast. The defenestration of lads. Something you can listen to with your kids. <laughs> <laughs> all right, should we do a real quick green room? Let's do a real quick green room. Oh, wait, sorry. Actually, no. We can't do Green Room yet because we need to talk about some of my stuff. Um, I'm so I'm so used to um, not talking about my stuff um, that I totally forgot about that. So yeah, not Green Room yet. Green Room in a bit. Let's talk about uh, some uh, artifacts and content. I, I made a new video since the last time we talked. It's called Redos and Retcons, episode four, I think it was. I, of... I think you did episode three since we last talked as well. Oh, did we? I think so. Oh my god! Okay, certainly I watched it since we last talked. Wow. Okay, so there could potentially be two episodes. Those will be linked in the uh, show notes. I, I actually, I'll open the floor to you in a sec, Bill, if you have specific questions about them. But I actually don't really want to talk about any of the content in those videos. I want to talk about content that will come up in future videos and get your sort of vibe check on some of the thoughts I'm having. Okay. Um, so before I do that, um, do you have anything on the list? To discuss with me. Why is right it now bad in this podcast? What? <laughs> I'm joking. I'm go on. Why is it bad to leave the galactic plane? I don't know. Actually, I just cool. Just stars tend to be in the galactic plane, uh, and it would be unusual if they dipped in and out of it. So I'm not sure if it's like bad, bad per se, but I guess weird. Okay. Hmm. Um, how long is the rotation of the galaxy? Like, like, like the, the rotational period of the galaxy? I have not figured it out. Okay, let's find out. Milky Way. <laughs> nor, nor do I really intend to, because again, as we've pointed out before, uh, I don't want to be in this space phase for very long because most, yeah. most people don't like it. So I'm not going to fill out, uh, characteristics of the galaxy beyond what yeah. I absolutely need. Um, nor are we going to flesh out the details of each and every planet in the system um of course just to speed it along so all of that is just kind of unspecified um details well if any of the listeners are wondering the milky way takes about 200 million years to complete one rotation uh, you mean the sun takes about 200 million years to complete one rotation because like not every point in the milky way will take that long to complete a rotation Oh, look, I just I just typed in rotational period of Milky Way. That's what I got. That's I think that's the sun's galactic year. Hold on, googling, googling. Do you know what's a great travesty? When you Google the sun, the first, at least for me, the first number of articles are the English tabloid, and that's a damning indictment on us humanity. I get the Irish sun. Oh, maybe. Oh, I didn't realize there was an Irish sun. I don't read tabloids. I don't read newspapers, so I just figured it was English. Well, no. It- I, I, it says the words the Irish sun. <laughs> yeah. That's all I know. <laughs> um, um, yeah. How so long? galactic year is the duration of time for the sun to orbit once around the center. Um, 
I suppose because they're not actually physically connected, things will take different times, yeah. Yeah, like if you're orbiting in the core of the galaxy, you're zipping around that core really quickly relative to what you would be doing if you were on the outskirts. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and I get, yeah, that is that is a short enough timescale for things to be relevant to the development of life, etc. So maybe there is something to that. Maybe, um, I guess, hold on, so that's, what did you say it was? 200 million years. Yeah, of course. So according to Wikipedia, uh, the sun orbits 2.25 times 10 to the 8 years to take one orbit, and that's 200 million years. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, that Again, not specifying that because I don't intend for it to have any ramifications, but I must I might actually talk to Bib about that, whether or not galactic orbits can have some sort of ramification for life. I guess you could, I don't know. I, I don't know, actually. That's an interesting one. I'll look into that. Um, the thing, I know you, you went back on this a little bit in episode four. A little bit. the hill spheres. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> but, like, so the, the, the idea there is that if something is in the hill sphere, then it will orbit the sun, right? K- kind of, kind of. But does that not, like, matter? Does, does the the mass of the object in question not matter as well? And treating another star like just another object in the hill sphere seems kind of weird. Like, would it not also matter the um, the the mass of the object, the other object you're talking about? And if there was two stars close together, that would be a totally different scenario, and that they they would pull on each other. Yeah, I think it, the answer to that is yes, it would matter. But I think another thing that would matter would be speed. Um, yeah, would be a huge one because like. Yeah, if you had, like, one star just bombing it along for whatever reason, and it could, like, do, like, a flyby of the uh, of, a, of, of an additional star and not get caught because of its speed, you know? Um, mm-hmm. th- there's a lot of play here. It's, it's, it's really complicated. Like, a- N-body problems are really complicated, and I don't fully know the answer. The astronomers in comments were like, it's fine. Um Fair enough. Apparently, we've ran simulations, and when whenever uh, some stars in the distant future will get close to the sun, like really close to the sun, apparently the simulations indicate that this wouldn't cause any major effects, uh, save for more comets will be thrown out of the Oort clouds. You might get a very comet-heavy environment, but you're not going to get things like apparently planets being knocked out of orbit and that sort of stuff going on. Um, so I'm just, I'm literally just trusting astronomers there because again, hill spheres are really complicated. Okay. All right. Cool. Cool. Yeah. I th- think those are my questions based on the last two videos. Okay, cool. Now, so the thing I want to talk about is the, the goal of these, this series is to do a basic setting, right? Mm-hmm. And by basic, it's largely, that means just like the most, uh, uh, I guess lean into the most common tropes in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, and just do the, do kind of like not very interesting things, but do them hopefully well, right? Um, so like, a, you know, if I had set my world around the black hole, that would fail the goal because that's a very complicated, non-typical setting. Um, yeah. So I've been trying to do some thinking about the future of this. And FYI, just artifacts here, this is a bit of a secret, so maybe don't, write this in the comments of the actual video so so few people listen to this video the, these podcasts that i'm okay sharing it here but just keep it between <laughs> between us um for the elite it's for the elite, exactly um so yeah i've been thinking about like culture right and the type of time period that i might experiment with on the planet and as per the goals of the series um that would imply a medieval setting Right, a low tech medieval type setting because the majority of fiction is set kind of in that time period. Um, certainly in a post Game of Thrones world where every single thing on Netflix, at least from my perspective, seems to be something that's set in a ye olde castle with ye olde squabbling royal families. That seems to be kind of the default expected setting for constructed settings. Um, would you concur, first of all? No. You would not. So what do you think is the sort of like the most frequently trodden time period uh, or aesthetic in, 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 in world building currently? 
Oh, I mean, sorry, I was just thinking specifically about the Netflix thing. Um, uh, you know, I'd have to do like an actual proper think about this, but I guess off the top of my head, if we're talking like what is the, the default kind of secondary world, what does it look like? Then, yeah, it would be sort of vaguely medieval, vaguely European medieval. So, as per the goals, I should do medieval Europe, right? But I kind yeah. of, it, it's kind of done to death, really. <laughs> like, there's so much of it. Um, and I've been playing a lot of Final Fantasy VII, the remake, uh, of late. And I'm playing good. a game called, what's that game called with the cat? Stray. Stray. I've been I've 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 bought Stray and I've played a little bit of that, and like is it adorable? It's it is it's a little bit scary in parts, <laughs> and I hate awesome. I hate like horror type things. But there was a couple of points where I was kind of like, oh god, is there a jump scare coming? And it never quite came, and that made me feel on edge. And I'm like, oh, but um, it is adorable. It's I, I've not finished it, so I don't know how it ends. But so far, I think it's it's well worth the thirty euro that it cost. Um, but in any case, both of those are set in a sort of modern, uh, high tech sort of mm-hmm. uh, sort of setting, and I find myself really gravitating towards that um, b- because uh, history is hard. <laughs> like there's lots of unknowns about history, um, whereas in the modern world. Uh, we kind of know a lot about the modern world. And I was thinking about whether or not going down a modern urban fiction would be a good call. And I, I want to bring that to you and I want to see what do you think. Um, do you like this kind of epoch in fictional worlds? Do you think other people will like it? Do you think it's an interesting thing to bring up? Um, thoughts? So... I'm trying to think examples of secondary worlds that are contemporary or kind of, you know, more or less modern, but aren't connected to Earth as such. Um, Yeah, I think it is. I think it is an interesting thing to play with. Um, I would I would like that as a setting and I would like to see more of it. Hmm. Um, because I feel like there's just from a sort of like education standpoint there's a lot of cool things you can lead into like you can lean into uh, another thing that I watch an awful lot of it is City Skylines content on YouTube Mm -hmm. I love watching people build cities and I like the sort of like architecture of cities and how we plan it and like the design of them and how we go about like theorizing about cities like you can really draw on lots of that sort of stuff whereas in medieval times at least as far as I'm aware it's like the city is basically a chaotic mess of streets that naturally evolved without any sort of thought process behind them. And then you slap on a perimeter wall and then, oh, it spills beyond the perimeter wall. So you slap on another perimeter wall. Um, there's kind of, there's so much more literature on the modern world that you can draw into, particularly with regards to the, the built environment that I think could be really interesting. I mean, that that does exist in historical settings, but I remember talking before about you know, not wanting to do one that wasn't European because, you know, you wouldn't have to do it justice or it wouldn't be wouldn't be fair or something. So Yeah. In a European context you're probably right. Um And I, I should say that unless I otherwise state it explicitly, I'm yeah, referring yeah, so, to Europe. Yeah. Medieval yeah. Europe. I'm trying to th- trying to think of examples of kind of secondary worlds that are modern, but not c- clearly connected to Earth. And while you're thinking, let me try mm-hmm. and, for you and the listener, just further sell this idea of okay. the modern setting. Uh, I think another plus point is that you can better do stuff on a global stage. So if mm-hmm. you're going to go to the hassle of fully detail- detailing out this planet, um, if it's a modern world that have like the equivalent of planes or whatever... Uh, you can engage with the whole planet a lot more readily. Now, that's not to say that in medieval times they didn't have ships that went exploring all over the world, but it's not as... You couldn't, like, imagine a protagonist globetrotting as easy as you can on a modern world. So I think that's a huge plus point. And also I think um, geopolitical machinations, at least for me, are easier to think about uh, in the context of the modern world. Because... Um, I kind of have an intuitive feel for like what the military power of a modern nation state is and 
how will that play into geopolitics? Whereas I have a very difficult time thinking about the equivalent in a medieval world because just everything's so different. There are no tanks, there are no machine guns. What does the threat of violence from one group or whatever mean to another group when Mm -hmm. the level of violence is so far removed from what we are used to? Um, and then on top of that, like I said, I, I read an awful lot of World War I stuff and listen to an awful lot of World War I stuff. So I'm kind of well acquainted with like... I didn't know that about you. <laughs> is that sarcasm? No, I didn't. I genuinely didn't. Oh, no, I, I, I've I um, mentioned this in the show before. I love World War I. Okay. Do you yeah. know why, do you know why World War I is so great, Phil? I don't. It's one of the first wars. I guess the American Revolutionary War would be an earlier example. But it's one of the first war- wars where we suddenly realized we are modern and you have this beautiful, a beautiful, like, g- gory clash of like old, old time warfare techniques like bayonet charges, but with machine guns mixed in and the sort of like shock of modern warfare hitting European armies is endlessly fascinating. Um, Did you say the American Revolution had that? Uh, no, well, the American Revolution um, is engaged in an awful lot of the tactics uh, that we would see in the European theatre. And uh, according to various podcasts I've listened to, uh, apparently... Do you mean the Civil War? Oh, I could be referring to the ro- wrong war. I don't know. One of the... Amer- the American War that, like, came before the World War... The one ah yeah that is the civil war civil war yeah. okay sorry my term, I don't see I'm not an American war fan so I don't know exactly yeah. um but yeah and then you you know bayonet charges into machine gun fire because it just didn't know better like nuts mm. like that's insane um or things like at the start of the war you have people romanticizing the war and going off on a grand tour a grand adventure and war is just like this fun thing that like you know you might end up in a battle that lasts for like a day and you may survive, good chance of surviving. And then they land and it's like trench warfare for months on end. Um, and it's just such a radical shifting of the mindset of what militarism is. And it's just, it's just this beautiful epoch in, in a way that the second, I'm sorry, I'm waffling now, but in the way that Second World, <laughs> World War isn't, it's like we matured and like we know what modern warfare is and then let's go Second World War and everything's just a lot more clinical Um Whereas in World War One, it's just a giant mess, and that makes for very interesting reading. Anyhow, mm. all that is to say, all that is to say that like I'm kind of more acquainted with warfare and geopolitical machinations in a modern-ish world than I am with medieval times, and all of that I think, but could culminate into a better, more detailed, more interesting setting. But it sidesteps the goal of do the expected thing, which would be medieval Europe. Um, and this is why I'm bringing it up to see what your opinions are on that. Have you have you thought of a a example of a, a constructive world that's modernish? I thought of two. Mm, go for it. Uh, the first one, uh, kind of silly, uh, but Gears of War. I don't know what that is. It is a video game. I think it's an Xbox game, um, and it's like a kind of. It was one of the first cover based shooters. Um, and it's very interesting because there's no clear indication of anything being related to Earth in it, and it's, um, you know, it's very, it's probably actually like a futuristic, like somewhat futuristic kind of setting, um, and despite not being set on Earth, it manages to recreate a lot of like racial stereotypes in the characters in a really uncomfortable way. Oh dear. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's not great. <laughs> Um, like, you know, you, you, you don't, you don't have the same, you know, society or countries as, as earth, but like some of the racism is the same. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. I was always a little bit off put by that. Um, but that is, that was just the the first one that came to mind because I remember thinking of that about it and how strange it was. Um, so much Chernomaval stuff you could maybe say it's not exactly modern, modern, um, but it's kind of maybe early 20th century, like the Potato Street Station would be... Um, yeah, and I guess a lot of steampunk in general would fall into uh, this category, wouldn't it? I'm not, I'm, I'm not that into steampunk, so like kind of secondary world. Too many gears. Yeah. <laughs> Aesthetically bankrupt. 
<laughs> Aesthetically, yeah. oh dear. Okay, I hope no one's into uh, is into uh, steampunk here. Sorry, I apologize <laughs> on behalf of, of, no, no, of the Artifacts like, podcast. So, some of it's great. Um, the Difference Engine was was a great novel, um, and there is good stuff there. But it's 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 a very it's a very low um, kind of engagement for for me and my interest in history. I just find it a very kind of superficial take on it when actual Victorian culture and stuff is so interesting. Mm. Um, yeah, to it, just, it, ju- just use the aesthetics and and kind of strip everything else and use them kind of outside context. It's always kind of... Well, not always, but it's, it's sort of, it puts me off a little. I, I agree. It is a very aesthetic-heavy aesthetic, <laughs> if you will. Um, mm. Yeah, and it does give the vibe of... Now, ignorant person here, I don't really engage with steampunk, but it does give the vibe of we care more about the aesthetics than sort of more fundamental things. Um, but I could be entirely wrong about that. Um, I mean, I guess Broken Earth, kind of, sort of, in a way. I guess that's kind of like a, a an apocalyptic modern setting. Mm. Um, the, I mean, one of the things I liked about that was that it was all over the place in terms of historical analogues. Yeah, now, when I say modern setting, like I don't mean like it's literally going to be a carbon copy of Earth as it currently is. Like, it would be cool to do... Uh, a bit of mismatching of time time periods but like overall you know the idea is that you have like uh easy travel across the world um you have big cities um mm-hmm. that sort of thing but like you know exactly what the tech level is can vary within that i think and it, that could lead to some interest yeah which could be hard to do now that i think about it but like hey i got years to think about it yeah <laughs> You don't have to have to decide it live on air, um, but yeah, no, I, th- I think I think that would be a fun place to explore. Okay, for you, no, um, and also look if that's if that's what you you find more interesting, just do that. Yeah, it's mad. I really do like, I've, and it's particularly the city. Like, just to like re-emphasize another thing I said a second ago. Like, I love cities. Like, I I adore the built environment, and maybe it's because of my travels in in Asia. Um, because I just, the, the aesthetic of Asian cities are just great. Um, because they kind of um, had, uh, okay, not all of them, but like in some places they had like rapid modernization. Um, and that leads to a sort of aesthetic of kind of, uh, how do I explain this? Like a patchwork sort of aesthetic where you have mm. like giant skyscraper, but then like a few blocks away, you have like old towny type vibes that's been like retrofitted with electricity. So there's like a bunch of like uh, cables and wires just strewn everywhere, connecting all these things up in a random higgledy piggledy sort of way. And it, that just, just vibe is just, just, I love it. Like I absolutely adore it. Um, so anyway, anyway, anyway. Um, do you like the painter Edward Hopper? I've never heard of him, but I'm going to look at some of his work. You'll, you'll definitely recognize when you see him. Hopper. Edward Hopper. Edward Hopper. Oh, that's the famous um, bar scene. Night, Nighthawks, yeah. The cafe scene from outside. Um, he, he has lots of paintings of kind of jumbly city skylines and like looking out people's back windows into yards and oh. <coughs> tangled tangled wires and poles and things, which uh, that that's that's what I love. Like when you look him up, I hear I'm just seeing a lot of Nighthawks and Automat and kind of more idyllic scenes. But he, he does have a lot of that sort of city, jumbly city stuff, which I, I absolutely love. If, if you Google Asian telephone wires there for a second for me and just go look at the images, like this sort of thing, just I find great. <laughs> yes, I know. The, yes, yes, I know the kind of thing you mean. And, and the thing that's awesome is like, uh, I, I found this in, in Indonesia. You'd have this aesthetic, links in the show notes to the Google image page on this. You'd have this aesthetic of like just man's, uh, dominance over land everywhere, just like a bunch of wires and concrete and higgledy piggly sort of things, but also like in a rainforest. So it's very hard to stop the rainforest from encroaching. So you have like this very stark contrast between like mm. the lush natural world and like the harsh grays and blacks of the man-made world in a way that mm. I just don't think we we get up here in the barren north um, <laughs> that I just find it's endlessly endlessly fascinating and like small city streets bill like i love the sort of like the the feeling of adventure going down alleyways like where does this thing lead and it's just oh 
Adore it. Absolutely adore it. As long as it's a country that's green on the Global Peace Index. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> the, only, only a certain safe kinds of adventure. Did, did you find the same thing, like what you're talking about, like the infrastructure, uh, like there was a commonality between Korea and Indonesia? Uh, I mean, yeah, kind of, except Korea just is a lot more uh, modernized than the areas of Indonesia we were. Like, we didn't go to, uh, um, what's the capital of Indonesia? Jakarta. J- Jakarta. We didn't go to Jakarta. We were in Bali and that. So it, it's right. a lot smaller of a vibe. Uh, Korea's was very much like massive concrete communist block towers everywhere with mm-hmm. like hidden small little old timey places strewn around it um and indonesia felt like it was kind of getting there do you know um yeah and Mo- oh. and again just reiterate from the last show moscow is the worst worst city hate it <laughs> awful um anyhow anyhow so artifacts here thoughts let me know what would you think of a modern urban environment uh, environment i get the impression that a lot of people want like they either want fantasy which means medieval europe or they want sci-fi which is like star trek and star wars and i'm kind of going in between both of them is what i'm leaning towards i want to know what your what your thoughts are where do you think that would be fun um yeah just talk to me about it and we'll see what we do um yeah yeah Perfect. Sounds good to me. Um, oh, oh, quick story. And then actually, do you know what? We'll wrap it no, up. No, you said done, Edgar. We have to, we have to Bill, stop. Bill, you're not you the boss done. of me. <laughs> <laughs> um, just a quick story on the peace index thing. Uh, the, remember I said I have a cousin who lives in Sudan. Yes. They came home and I actually missed them because I was I was recording. Um, but they, they came to the house and I've, I haven't seen them in years. Um, so so the captain was talking to them and uh, we all got formally invited to Sudan. And I was like, oh, uh, are you, yeah, but Sudan is, is, it's very red on the map. And then, so I did the thing where I was like, okay, right. But these things are all very subjective. You know, one man's red is another man's orange. Let's just, Ooh. let's just look into it. And As the saying goes. <laughs> exactly. Um, and I looked into it and the Wikipedia page just terrified the crap out of me. Apparently of late, there's been like a lot of unrest and I'm like, no, I can't do that. Like I want to go to Sudan. I'd, ha- I'd have like free accommodation because I'd be staying with family and, you know, I'd be in with locals and they could tell me where to go and what to see. But God, it just, the Wikipedia page terrified the living daylights of me. I couldn't, couldn't do it, like. Um, but in any case, um, it's an hour and a half, right? And we've been aiming, well, at least implicitly, I've been aiming for about that length of shows just to keep the premiere short-ish, you know, on YouTube. Manageable, yeah. Manageable, exactly. So we're not asking everyone to be there for like two or three hours. So... I'm going to make an executive call if it's okay with you, Bill. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say no green room this episode. No green room? No green room. Because all we were going to talk about in the green room was basically what recipe we're going to cook for the cooking show. Um, So I think I'm just going to talk to you about that off air. And we'll talk about next time. So this show isn't crazy long. Okay. Yeah. So this is it. This is it. It's a very anticlimactic ending, but I think it's good for time. (laughs) Um, Folks... Thank you, as always, for watching. Thank you uh, for patronizing. Uh, YouTube deleted the AdSense account on me, which was interesting. Uh, I saw that. Yeah, yeah not, what was not, that about? Not that we make... We, we basically make zero money on ads from YouTube. I think we're in... We, we've gotten up to the high cents uh, nice. in terms of revenue. So it doesn't actually matter. But, like, you know, in the unlikely circumstance that this podcast, like, blows up, like, it's not going to happen, but, like, if it does blow up, it's nice to know there's patrons there. Uh, now, is that high sense per video? Uh, high sense uh, per month, I think I have it set at. Per month, okay. <laughs> so, like, three times a year, we could split a bag of crisps. We could, yeah, yeah, yeah. We should, okay. you know what we should do? We should, we should, uh, we should, we should actually do that and, like, performatively eat the crisps on air, on air. and then, you know, talk about how great that YouTube daddy is and, it, you know, pays us ASMR. so much money for our 
our time and effort that we put into it, the platform, and continuing its vibrancy with a diverse array of content. Um, and we can we mull over that while we chew on crisps that we barely are able to afford because of the crap you YouTube ad sets revenue. <laughs> um, but in any case, I bring it all up to say that uh, it doesn't actually matter. But thank you for patron- patronizing the show. Orders of magnitude, more money comes in because of you and YouTube sucks. So yeah, thanks for watching the show. Thanks for supporting us on Patreon. Thanks for checking out the merch. merch. Link to all Links to all of this is in the show notes. Until next time, Edgar out. out.